Welcome to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. Coming up on today's show, President Obama is trying to convince America to fight a war to the benefit of Saudi Arabia. We'll bring you the details. The GOP has come a long way since being the party of Lincoln, and, and we'll tell you how they've evolved into a party of crazy. And we'll be talking about how disastrous Larry Summers has been for the U.S. economy and why he poses a serious threat to this country still. We have all that and more coming up, but right now, I want you to remember, you've just stepped into the ring of fire. You can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. Grand jury secrecy rules. For political gain. The press can find out. It has nothing to do with politics, but go ahead. It wouldn't bother me. Oops. <laughs> the official story on what happened in Syria has changed about three times, and Americans are becoming fed up with this administration's push for war. But Arab nations led by Saudi Arabia are desperate for the U.S. to step in. And I'm joined now by Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson to tell us what's really happening behind the scenes. Colonel Wilkerson, you've seen all of this before, haven't you? This is not the first time that you've uh, seen this game being played out uh, with the United States saying we're under great risk. We have to take immediate action. There's no time for reflection. There's no time for diplomacy. We must act now. Uh, tell us, is, is that what you see developing here? What is your take on it? You tell me. I just watched the president's press conference, and I think he did a, a fairly good job of trying to defeat that idea that we are rushing to judgment. That said, you're right. As a teacher, I teach everything from World War II forward, presidential decision making in particular. And as an individual and a government official, I was associated with three different administrations, George H.W. Bush, Bill Clinton, and then George W. Bush. And I've seen this before. Um, it is becoming an all too recurrent theme in this republic, if we can indeed call it a republic anymore, uh, in its lifetime. Uh, we have almost made war making one of our principal occupations. Yeah, well, I, what, I saw an interview with you. I, I was very impressed with an interview uh, maybe a week ago. And you hit on something that I, you said was going to develop in so many words. And you, and you were like a prophet. It is developing. Uh, the, the issue is that the, the change in the narrative. The narrative begins, we must do something from a, a purely humanitarian standpoint. We must do something. Uh, we, heard that, we heard that again with uh, the speeches that Obama is giving time and time again. Uh, 1,400 people, 400 children. It, obviously, it's an awful atrocity, no question. And then we're, we're starting to hear now that narrative change by way of John Kerry. John Kerry, of course, is bringing in all the swords and saying, gee whiz, if we don't do anything, there are chemical weapons that are going to end up in the hands of terrorists. We must do something now because uh, if we don't do anything, not only will the weapons end up in the hands of the terrorists, but the, the regime will make a shift to the terrorist regime uh, because right now, as he puts it, the, the good guys are in charge of the, of the rebellion. How do you see all that? Uh, process that for me, if you would. I don't process it very well. As I said, I've heard this kind of language before. So I, I have a real problem with this sort of thing. I have a real problem with the rhetoric, the high rhetoric, the emotional rhetoric that John Kerry, for, for example, evinced, and how he could, as Secretary of State, give specific numbers of the dead when those numbers have been ambiguous since the beginning of this conflict and still are ambiguous, we still don't know how many were killed in the whole Syrian war, let alone the chemi uh, alleged chemical attacks, is beyond me. I mean, that kind of specificity tells me right away that somebody's fudging the material I'm listening to. Every time, uh, every time this discussion takes place, it's almost as if we ignore the fact of who is it that really wants to accomplish something here. Well, most people, if you, if you take a look at corporate media uh, on this, Colonel Wilkerson, you very rarely see the discussion about uh, King Abdul, you see, uh, the discussion about, uh, uh, about the, the Saudi Arabians having such an interest in toppling that government of Assad for many reasons. This is not new. Uh, it goes all the way back, as you probably know, to the Sunni-Shiite disagreements. That, that always end up in some type of civil rebellion. But w why have we avoided the discussion 
about the fact that what we're being asked to do is basically be mercenaries, the way I see it, uh, for Saudi Arabia. You may totally disagree with it. That, that's my words. But it appears to be that that has to be something the, the American public has to factor in here. I think you're absolutely correct with regard to Saudi Arabia. It, it, it almost was patently clear when the administration began to say that Saudi Arabia would pay for our uh, use of force in Syria. Uh, the Saudis, uh, Prince Bandar, head of their intelligence apparatus at the head of this, have been majorly instrumental in fueling this conflict in Syria. They are probably the biggest contributor to the opposition's ability to get arms. To include, I might add, the possibility they furnished the sarin gas containers were later opened up during a conventional barrage by the uh, Syrian forces, and then the Syrian forces got blamed for the full dispersal. I don't know that for a fact, but I do know there are intelligence people telling me, both retired and, and still active, that this is a, a, a possibility. This could have happened. So that sheds some light on the fact that the intelligence might not be as ironclad as the administration is saying it is, too. But the Saudis are at the center of this entire thing. Next come the Turks, uh, who have a reason to be uh, desirous of Assad's overthrow. Uh, so you've got other people playing in this in a way that the United States should have if it was really concerned about the 100,000 alleged casualties in Syria over the last two years. The United States should have been doing something about this. It should have been bringing pressure to bear on the Saudis, on the Turks, the Iranians, and others who are fueling this conflict as much as any opposition or Assad is fueling it. Well, we see, um, we see certainly the, the argument for the humanitarian argument. There are things that we do most of the time if, we, if we're concerned about uh, trying to solve a humanitarian atrocity like, we, what, like what has taken place here. It's still, still too soon to know who did what. But one thing you do, you certainly, you, you certainly use the, the, the power of negotiation, the power of sitting down and having peace talks of some kind with all of the players. And here, obviously, that would be Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Russia, uh, Iran. Uh, it would be everybody at a table. And I don't know that we've even done that here, have we? No, we have not. And you, you're, you're not going to have a meaningful political solution, which I have after all, is the only way you're going to solve this very horrible, bitter conflict. You're not going to have that kind of solution if you don't have all these players sitting at the table. It's difficult. It's, it's extremely difficult. But we haven't done this kind of diplomacy in a long, long time. We've let that skill atrophy. We've let the skill of talking atrophy. We've substituted for that skill bombs, bullets, and bayonets. And I think the American people are growing increasingly tired of that substitution. They would rather see people talking, they'd rather see uh, diplomacy work, uh, attention paid to the problems in this country, rather than the continued use of the war instrument to wreak havoc on other countries without any real positive results coming out. Look at Libya. Libya's a haven for al-Qaeda right now, has destabilized Mali next door, and may de destabilize Niger. Right. Um, Syria, I, I, I fear, will be even worse in its aftermath than Iraq, Afghanistan, or Libya. Um, we're really sticking our, our, our left hand, as it were. Maybe the president said a, a finger of our left hand in this tar baby. But once you stuck that finger, that hand in that tar baby, it's not going to turn you loose. Yeah. Let me ask you about this. Uh, isn't there th this notion, I, I still don't, maybe you can help our, our viewers understand this. I don't understand the notion of a strike, a surgical strike that's going to change much. Isn't it, isn't it almost a so what factor? Doesn't Assad say, okay, well, you know, bring on your, your missiles, your cruise missiles, your smart bombs and whatever, but you're going to be over here and I'm going to be over here. And then isn't there that so what factor that, that then says, well, I, I, Assad says, well, now I've got to do something to respond. I mean, doesn't it just continue escalating like that? I think you're right if it is just the two or three days of a few cruise missiles and a few high-performance aircraft with precision-guided munitions, if it's just a punishment strike for having used chemical weapons, were I Assad, and I don't see him as a stupid man. If I were Assad, I would simply shrug my shoulders and continue to prosecute the war. And he's holding his own, if not winning. So what do we do then? 
And then if we do what my party wants to do, at least members of my party like John McCain and Lindsey Graham, and perhaps even Democrats like Bob Menendez, and really conduct some Kosovo-like, robust, around-the-clock, intensive bombing of Syria, we change the balance of the war. And once you've done that, you own that war. So what are you going to do then, Mr. President? And I would say this, too. Anytime you drop bombs, anytime you shoot cruise missiles, drones, anything like that, you change the dynamic. And when you think that you can do it antiseptically and not change the dynamic, when you kill people, you are going to change the dynamic. Well, you mentioned Kosovo. This is an interesting thing. I, I, if you've, uh, if you, and I know you've done this, but I, I, I think Chalmers, Johnson, Howard Zinn were masters of going back and kind of looking at in reflection of what happened when we did these things. What happened when we said we can get involved in, in conflicts that maybe we should have stayed out of? Kosovo is a great example. If you take a look at what we did over that in that area, what you've basically uh, got over there is a crime capitalism, don't you? I mean, what, what did we leave? I mean, what came out of that that's good? What's coming out of Libya that's good? What's coming out of Iraq that's good? It usually doesn't end well, does it? No, it doesn't. Um, but I would hasten to add, too, that <clears throat> we, we went into Kosovo basically with the Air Force and others telling Clinton, three days of bombing and Milosevic will cave. <laughs> well, it took 78 days of bombing, and he still wasn't ready to cave until Wes Clark, really our commander in NATO, really violated all the political principles of NATO, went straight to Tony Blair, straight to Bill Clinton, and said, I need ground forces. NATO won't give them to me. I need you to OK ground forces. I'm going to make a threat. He made that threat. He moved Apache helicopters in a position to support the ground forces. And Milosevic took a look at that and said, uh-oh, they're serious. And then he gave in. So the ending is the gonna, ending is not the ending is often not what we think it's going to be, uh, and and I think you've been you've you've told that story so well so many times, having been there involved firsthand. Uh, in just about a minute, uh, it, it seems like the big winners here may be the McDonnell Douglases, the Boeing's, the large arms industry. I think two years ago, I think their their income was some uh, collectively was around eighty billion dollars a year. It's dropped now to about twenty six billion dollars. This may be their chance to have the stock rise. What do you think? I think you're absolutely right. Look at Raytheon, who makes cruise missiles, the majority of them. Uh, their stock will shoot up at least $10 as soon as the first cruise missile flies. Colonel, thank you. Uh, as, as usual, you, you seem to get these kinds of stories right, and I appreciate you joining us, okay? Thanks for having me. Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson is the former chief of staff to Colin Powell. Coming up, we'll look at why the GOP went from being the party of Lincoln to the party of Michelle Bachman. I'm Mike Papantonio. We'll be right back with more Ring of Fire. Welcome back to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. A few decades ago, it was completely embarrassing for someone to admit that they were a member of the Republican Party because of the Michelle Bachman and Glenn Beck factor. And I don't know that that's changed that much. But I have attorneys Howard Nations and Mike Berg with me now to tell us how the GOP has been identified as the party of crazy. Howard, it looks like just this loony kind of realignment taking place with uh, the Republican Party that's been evolving, quite frankly, for quite some time, all the way, all the way back to Lee Atwater's um, uh, southern state strategy that really started tearing the Republicans apart. What, what is your take on what's happening w with all this right now? Yes, the realignment began with, it, which is a systematic shift in patterns of uh, electoral support for a political party. What the classic example of this is the white southerner shift to the Republicans after the Civil Rights Act was signed in 1964 by President Johnson. And this all began with the Civil War. After the Reconstruction during the 1870s drove the South into the Democratic Party and it became known as the Solid South because it was absolutely solid Democrat. 
and it had a very populist appeal. The Republican Party at the time was Midwest small towns of the North, but it was then a business party as it is today. But their principles were based on personal responsibility, self-sufficiency, and it was actually better suited for the South, but for the civil rights position, better suited for the South, which was rural Anglo-Saxon Protestants. They were in favor of small government. But the Lincoln, Lincoln Republican Party, the Reconstruction, it settled deeply into the Southern Yeah, and, and of course, Lee Atwater figured out how to tie into all that and how to inflame all that and how to turn Beautifully. everybody uh, in the South against everybody that was not that didn't happen to lift there. Michael, uh, Eisenhower seemed, if you take a look at Eisenhower, he seemed to be, uh, and he's very often called, the last rational mind that, uh, that came out of the Republican Party as far as uh, kind of really a centrist, somebody that didn't, you know, he very suspect of the extremist, ex suspect of the military complex, suspect of the crazy religious right. Uh, what, what, what's your take on where we, we are since then? Well, Eisenhower was a war hero, so he had great popular appeal, uh, both with Democrats and Republicans. What happened after that, though, was a polarization. The Republicans began to polarize their party to the right. Uh, as you know, my partner, Alan Simpson, was the minority whip. Uh, and actually was the majority whip with Bush. I was with him yesterday. We talked about that polarization. What has happened is that the party centrists of the Republican Party have moved and polarized the party so far to the right that moderates are not even allowed to be in the party or speak to the party. Uh, he, for one, has been told the fact that he's worked with uh, Obama on a number of the commissions, that somehow he's a traitor to the Republican Party. Yeah, he's a, he's a rhino, as they put it, right? <laughs> uh, he's, even though he, he actually st he tries, to, he tries to speak with a rational mind, he does remember the days of statesmanship of real politicians like, uh, uh, you know, like Eisenhower, for example, but he's considered a rhino. Howard, the, uh, the polarization, what's your take on it? How would you characterize the polarization and what it means for this Republican Party? Well, there's an excellent book out by Jeffrey Cabot Service that's on the market right now that explains it in interesting terms. He says, of course, of course the polarization is a big factor in the movement, but this, the other thing that has built the Republican Party today, it's been moved by political actors. And it's, they realized that they had enemies on two fronts. They were not only against liberal Democrats, but they were against moderate Republicans. And Buckley, Buckley's National Review said, the modern conservatism formed in opposition to the Eisenhower administration. And there have been four things that brought about the transformation, uh, and that is grassroots, everything, you gotta give them credit. They worked everything from the local precincts all the way through to the national party, the conservatives taking it over. The second thing were institutions, the misnamed, the great misnomer think tanks, such as National Review and the Heritage Foundation. The third was religious groups, such as the Moral Majority, which was neither moral nor a majority. And then there's the media technology, conservative voices on the radio and, and, and cable television. And the goal was to purge the Republicans of moderate voices and install conservatives at every single power position. They were gonna purify the party. Has, uh, Michael, has this been a windfall or a disaster for the Republicans? Well, it, it, you know, it's, in some ways it's a windfall and a disaster, to be honest with you. It's a disaster because they're out of touch with the rest of the country on the social issues. It's been a windfall because they've been able to really shut down democracy for them. That's what they want to do. They want no government. Not little government, but no government. And, and they've been able to accomplish that because they take such extreme positions. As Senator Simpson mentioned to me yesterday, he would work across the aisle. He and Ted Kennedy were best friends. They would compromise on the issue so that democracy would work. Today, that doesn't exist. And in fact, just talking to someone across the aisle for these right-wing conservatives is, is basically a slap in the face to the party. Does Alan Simpson, uh, you are his law partner, Michael, does Alan Simpson believe that this trend is reversible or is it, uh, is it, it ha has it caught so much steam that we all know the ending to this story and that is uh, Republican Party and demise? 
Well, what, what he thinks may happen is that actually some of the far left liberals and some of the far right conservative Tea Party people are, may join together, that's the hope, with regard to protecting individual rights. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing right now with the NSA is you are seeing people on the far left and the far, far right saying, look, you know, we need to have, and they are joining together. Also with regard to the rights relating to litigation in terms of immunity for giant corporations. So on the one hand, he's concerned about it, but he's hopeful that we may be able to get back to a government that may begin to work. But, but for right now, he sees it as a demise of the GOP. Howard, uh, Mike just raises the, the, what we're seeing this week, all week, and that is uh, the really uh, uh, far-right tea, uh, tea Partiers reaching out to the, to the moderate to left liberals uh, in regard to the Syria uh, disaster train wreck that is, uh, that's playing itself out right now. Uh, what, do, what is your take on it? What, 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 kind of, what kind of joint relationship does that mean for the politics of both parties? Well, the Democrats obviously have fewer conservatives. So what they're doing is forming a, co a coalition between liberals and moderates, and Democrats are appealing strongly to independents. And we can't forget the independents in this mix because they can often be the swing voters. Democrats have very strong, they're very strong in the Midwest. They control the coast, and they're making inroads in, in uh, urbanized South and in Florida. The Republicans have their strength in the interior and in the states of the Old South. But where they're strong, in the mountain states and the prairie states, very thin populations. So they're going to have to do something. And what's happening with the Tea Party, as the extreme voters maintain more and more control, they're alienating the independents and the larger segments of the population, such as minorities and, and women. The more alienation, the more power goes to the extremes, and the extremes are the Tea Party. How is, how is a character like Rand Paul playing out, uh, Howard? Uh, Rand Paul, of course, is, you know, there, there's so few things you can ever agree with where it comes to Rand Paul. He, he's right about Syria. He's right about our war machine for probably the wrong reasons. But wh where does he fall in this future spectrum for what used to be a kind of a well-defined Republican Party? Well, Rand Paul is a voice that started out more in terms of the same line as the Tea Party. He's thought of as being to the right. But now, as the Tea Party moves further and further to the right, Rand Paul is taking positions that make him look more reasonable and more acceptable as he's setting himself up to run for president. And so whether he's actually going to be accepted or not is, is very highly questionable because in the most recent poll of, uh, from Wall Street Journal and the NBC News, what we found was that the, the Tea Party has gained a little bit uh, recently in, in terms of a positive view among Republicans, 51% up from 46% in January, but they're down considerably from their high of 63% in December. Yeah, the more we know, the scarier they are. Uh, yeah. uh, Michael, the, we, we hear the term obstruction, 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 it's gonna kill the Republicans, and we, we hear that. And intuitively, we believe that, yeah, the a rational public would look at these people and say, look, there's nothing we can agree on any time for anything that's positive about this country. We want to stop the country. We don't want to move anything positive in this country. And, and you, the rational mind would say, well, that's not good for a political party. Is that true here? Well, it depends on where we're talking with regard to their base, which we've talked about in the Midwest, uh, in you know Kansas and Nebraska in the South. It's good for their party because that's what the populace, uh, that's what the what the what the voters there are looking for. They want and believe that the government is not looking out for their best interests. The one thing I want to go back to, though, is the fact that the Tea Party on this Syria issue are talking to people across the aisle. I think is a good thing. Once you begin to talk to each other, you may find out there are other things that you can agree on, and maybe the country can get going. I, I think the bottom line is that 
that the Republicans find themselves really between a rock and a hard place. Are they going to continue to move to the right and polarize the country and, and not be able to elect on a national level the president and vice president? Or are they going to continue to try to move and, and coordinate with some of the Democrats and find grounds in which they can agree upon, whether it be the NSA issues, whether it be Syria, if that happens, we may see new coalitions that occur in this country, which change what's going on in the GOP. Howard, don't you get in about 30 seconds, don't you get the impression that uh, the, the, the Republicans care so little about the national scene compared to what they're doing state by state? I think you've reported on this a couple of times. And that seems to be where their grip is in what they're going to hold on to is simply go state by state, avoid all this, this, you know, this discussion this, uh, that, that takes place on a, on a national scene where it comes to the big elections. What's your, it, has that changed in your mind at all that they, they have a very no. clear methodology for trying to gain control in this country? Absolutely. The reason they will not go into coalitions is because they have to cater to their base. The more they cater to their base, the further to the right they move. The further to the right they move, the higher profile they become, then they create more fear among Republicans who are afraid to run, who, who have to move to the right with them or they'll get uh, primaried in their own party. So it's more likely that what's going to happen is Michelle Bachman will remain the face of the party. Todd Aiken type candidates will continue to be out there and be suicidal, and the Democratic Party should thank them very much. Howard Nations, Michael Berg, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Michael. My pleasure. Coming up, investigative journalist Greg Palace is going to be here to tell us about the destructive economic policies of Larry Summers and maybe how Obama is continuing an extension of that. I'm Mike Papantonio. We'll be right back with more Ring of Fire. Welcome back to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. Larry Summers could actually become the next chairman of the Fed, and most people don't understand how dangerous that would be to our economy. I have investigative journalist Greg Pallas with me now to talk about the disaster that is Larry Summers. Greg, it seemed like uh, the, you had the Geithner crowd, you had the Larry Summers crowd, you had Robert Rubin in, intent on trying to sell toxic trash all over the globe. And one way that they could accomplish that was a story that you followed before anybody else was following it. But certainly it's a more important story now because we start seeing what they actually did. What they actually did is they, they used the financial services agreement by the WTO, enforced it on third world countries, forced it on Europe, forced it on South America. And we experienced a global burn down, not just a burn down in the United States with CDOs, synthetics, swaps, all that toxic trash. Yes. Uh, what I got my hands on was a copy of an internal memo, an internal memo of the Treasury Department written from Tim Geithner, who would become Treasury Secretary, to Larry Summers, who is about to become, or Obama prefers to uh, pick him as the new head of the Federal Reserve Board. In this note, Geithner and Summers are discussing what they call the end game. And the end game is a scheme that they had come up with uh, in coordination with five banks in secret, which you're not allowed to do. Five uh, bank CEOs and uh, Larry Summers and his assistant came up with the idea of changing the international trade treaties, which would allow these five banks to sell any country in the world. You couldn't resist. Any country in the world would have to accept what they call toxic assets. That is financial derivatives, such as uh, one of Goldman's favorites was the synthetic collateralized debt obligation on subprime mortgages. If it sounds complex, it is. It's junk. It's toxic. And this stuff was uh, just, uh, you know, the kindling which burnt down the financial world. Right. Uh, in order to make this happen on a globalized kind of way, they had to twist arms in places like, for example, Ecuador. They had to, uh, you, had, you had countries that resisted this pressure that they were getting from the Geithner crowd, Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, Citibank. They said, uh, hell no, we're not going to go down this path because we think it's, first of all, we think that it's toxic trash. We think it'll destroy our economy. But, but they pressed forward anyway. What are some of the ways they did that with some of these countries? 
Well, um, I actually met, I flew, I flew to Quito, Ecuador, and met with the, uh, with the president of Ecuador to ask him about it. I put forward the, in, this internal memo I got and several others in which Ecuador was forced to accept a bunch of these financially, you know, these financial toxic junk, like the collateralized CDOs and other derivatives. And the way that they did it, they said, look, if you don't accept this, uh, this junk from us, from uh, the U.S. banks, then we're not going to buy your bananas. Now, Ecuador is actually the quintessential banana republic. It's their main export. They don't sell bananas to the U.S. They're doomed. So the president of Ecuador, Rafael Correa, said we were up against the wall, and Ecuador was forced to open up its bank sector to this junk. And again, I want to emphasize that this whole scheme was done in secret involving Larry Summers and five bank CEOs. I have their private phone numbers. It was in the memos. I called one, and I got a, to uh, read at uh, Citibank, and, of course, got a click, and then the rest of the numbers were... Or, well, these, uh, these were uh, these were the go to people, Greg, as I follow yeah. your story, the Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, John Corzine, uh, David Kamansky, uh, David Coulter, all the regular Wall Street thug suspects. They were the they were the go to guys for Robert Rubin. They were the yes. go to guys for Larry Summers and, you know, his sidekick Geithner. And the, the idea was from, from, as I follow your story, they had to go to these countries and change the damn law. It's like Russia coming over to the United States saying, you know what, we don't like your regulations of banking. We want you to change them to be more in line with what we're doing in Russia. Did I get that right or is it an overstatement? No, no, that's exactly what happened. Five b big bankers, as you say, the go-to boys, got together secretly with Larry Summers, uh, then Deputy and later Secretary of Treasury, now the uh, Obama pick for uh, the Federal Reserve Board. They got together with Summers, and they came up with a scheme to eliminate banking regulation worldwide. Remember that they had eliminated banking regulation in the United States. This was done at the same time. You can't deregulate banks in the United States without deregulating every other bank in the world because sensible money is going to leave for safe banks. So you, what you do is you eliminate uh, regulations worldwide, and brilliantly, kind of sickly, they, they did it through changing the trade laws and change the trade laws of 155 nations. Only in other one words, fo system. follow the United States in its race to the bottom where it comes with regulatory protections that protect mom and, top, mom and pop consumers and, in fact, protect our entire economy. Let, let me tie up a few things that you've, yes. that you've uh, uncovered here. I just think it's is just brilliant. It, again, it's just, it's just good investigative writing. And one thing that you've done is you, 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 you shed light on the connections between Robert Rubin and Obama. You, you know, you, you remind us that this is, uh, that it was Robert Rubin who was kind of the money behind this Senator Obama before he was even in play for a presidency. And then take us from there, if you would. Before, you know, uh, where did Barack Obama come from? He was a state senator from the south side of Chicago, not exactly, you know, the, the uh, launching pad for the presidency. Uh, but what happened was is that his local banker was Penny Pritzker. Penny Pritzker ran something called Superior Bank. It was shut down by the federal government, and she and her family were fined nearly half a billion dollars. She's a billionaireess. She didn't like it, so she decided she was going to change the laws that nailed her and cost her half a billion. So she decided she needed a president. She backed Barack Obama, then her state senator, uh, funded him to become senator and then president. And she introduced him crucially. Pritzker introduced him crucially to Bob Rubin, who'd been with the Clintons. He switched to Obama during the primaries, and he brought with him Jamie Dimon, also of Chicago, uh, who was uh, head of what would become J.P. Morgan. So you had Rubin, you had Morgan, you had Pritzker. By the way, Pritzker was made the uh, uh, Commerce Secretary a couple of weeks ago by Obama. She raised three quarters of a billion dollars for him with the help of Robert okay, Rubin. Okay, so what we have, what we have is we have a, a law school professor that has, uh, you know, basically he, he, he emerges overnight, becomes a senator, and then becomes a president. Uh, the chances of uh, Robert Rubin ever even letting Obama use his back door to his mansion during the time that Obama was a professor is almost non-existent. 
But nevertheless, that evolution takes place, and all of a sudden, the Reuben crowd uh, and the Pritzker crowd, they have a candidate. Now, does that not explain a little bit about why Obama may be pushing a hard, pushing so hard to, to put in place Larry Summers to control the Fed, which is extremely dangerous, not just to this country, but the entire global economy? Yes, well, Larry Summers has always been the protege of Robert Rubin. Rubin, as Secretary of Treasury, came up uh, with the whole idea of eliminating, first and foremost, what we call the Glass-Steagall Act. And that separated commercial banks, where you have your savings accounts, from investment banks, which are basically gambling um, bank vaults with roulette wheels. Now, and in addition, Larry Summers was pushing this new market, this new so-called product by Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan called derivatives. Uh, and Again, Rubin, you know, insisted on making Summers his assistant, uh, his treasury uh, so, deputy. What, what was, well, of course, then, 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 then we have Summers. I mean, it's just so incestuous. Then Summers is yes. appointed this economic czar by Obama, and he r runs through that, and now he's going to run our entire Fed. Right. Well, after, after uh, Rubin allowed the creation of something called Citigroup, combining investment banks and Citicorp. Rubin then became its chairman and was paid $126 million. He got Clinton to make Summers uh, Secretary of Treasury, um, then made him president of, uh, of Harvard. New York Times said it was because of Rubin's demand. Then uh, Summers, again, after Rubin funds uh, the Obama candidacy, uh, Summers becomes his choice to run the economy. So instead of becoming Secretary of Treasury, he makes him an uh, economic czar because you don't have to go through a confirmation <laughs> process. Now. You do that with now a pen. Yeah, you do yeah. that with yeah. a pen. You say, thank you, Robert Rubin, for your money. Thank you, Ms. Pritzker, for your money. We're going to put your boy in charge here with just a stroke of a pen. Nobody's going to ask questions. It sounds good because we have something called an economic czar, which you were writing about early on saying, what in the hell is this. So let me let me back up just a little bit. Uh, let me back up a little bit on this. As we look at as we look at this whole story, um, it all has to do, of course, with the globalization uh, plan that was in place early on with the with the Clintons. But it wasn't globalization didn't really deal with things like financials. Globalization dealt with, I'm going to sell you a banana, you sell me a car, we're gonna have an exchange that somehow affects both of our GDP. We understand what the numbers are and we can follow that exchange. But then all of a sudden, Reuben turned all that on its head, Bill Clinton let him turn that on, on its head, and they went forward with this idea of globalizing the financials market. Is, does that sum up kind of where this all started? Yeah, in the simplest terms, the, the World Trade Organization used to control trade in goods, your bananas for my cars. Very simple. So we had rules of trade. What these guys did in coordination with these bankers secretly is to change the rules of trade so that you give us your goods, we give us our bads, you know, the, these toxic financial assets. No one ever thought of these as tradable commodities. In fact, it used to be considered called watered stock. It was illegal to even trade these things. They aren't good. They're, they're bad. And so this was a whole new business. And again, it was created by these backroom deals with the bankers. In fact, I should mention that I spoke to a member of Clinton's cabinet about this, Joe Stiglitz. Stiglitz right. was head of the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, Stiglitz was in the cabinet with Rubin and Summers when all this was being discussed. And Summers would turn to Rubin. He said, a time and time again, and say, what would Goldman think about this? What would Goldman think? <laughs> and, and, and Stiglitz finally turns to Summers and says, you know, they're in the White House. You know, he says, don't you think it's inappropriate to be asking what Goldman would think of our policies? How about, you know, what, what the facts are, what the, the what, American what would, public What would solid economists think about this, I think is probably the better question. Well, one thing that's worked for Summers is he's made a lot of money by being the lap monkey for uh, for virtually all of Wall Street, and and that lap dancing monkey has 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 increased his net worth by about thirty million dollars just since he got started in all this. Look, Greg Palace, this is great work as usual. Uh, you are the go-to guy. Uh, corporate America is so terrified to tell stories like this, and we're glad you're out there telling them. Thank you for joining me. Okay. Thanks for having me on, Mike.
When we come back, we'll find out how the citizens' media is fighting the military-industrial complex. I'm Mike Papantonio, and you're watching Ring of Fire. We'll be right back. You're watching Free Speech TV, a network powered by the people. Welcome back to Ring of Fire. I'm Mike Papantonio. With the administration beating the drums of war, the citizens' media is becoming increasingly more important. But is it enough to fight off America's military-industrial complex? I have Trial Lawyer Magazine editor Farron Cousins with me now to answer that question. Farron, it feels like Groundhog Day where it comes to wars in the Mideast. Uh, I'm not seeing a whole lot of difference between what we saw with the, the Iraq buildup and what we're seeing here. What's your take on it? I know if you, if you watched Obama's speech about a week ago, it, it very closely mirrored Bush's speeches when he was trying to push this country into Iraq. You know, you, you heard the same terms there. You heard weapons of mass destruction, chemical weapons, you know, a threat to the world. I mean, th there is no difference between what Obama was telling us a week ago and what George Bush was telling us 10 years ago. And one it, thing it, we are scary. seeing, fair, and one thing we are seeing is the stories, people seem to be picking up on the idea that the story and narrative of why we should do this has changed about three times as best I can, as best I can see. H have you noticed that? Yeah, and you know, when John Kerry sat before the Senate, you know, he told them that the greatest group you know, fighting against the government there were the moderates, you know, a lot, a lot of times it being the citizens rising up against the government. But the truth is, it's not moderates. It's not citizensry. This is the Muslim Brotherhood. This is, you know, there's Al Qaeda in there. They represent the strongest faction fighting the government in that country. So what I we thought were, was required, but before, yeah, yeah, that one point, we actually had Kerry, which I thought was so remarkable. Kerry, uh, John Kerry, appearing in front of the, the, the Congress and saying, gee whiz, you know what? These rebels, they're not Al Qaeda, and we know they're Al Qaeda. I mean, right. it's been reported time and time again that the leadership within the rebel movement is Al Qaeda. And so these are the same people that we understood, most Americans understood, we're fighting a war on terrorism against. So for Kerry to say that, doesn't it almost give you a memory of the Colin Powell years where Colin Powell was asked to, to, to go forward with misrepresentations about what was going on in Iraq? Well, you see, you almost have sympathy for Colin Powell because if you look back, I know you spoke with Lawrence Wilkerson earlier in the show, you know, Colin Powell was left largely out of those discussions where it was, you know, we're going to uh, falsify and fabricate this information. Colin Powell being the most honest one, he's going to go sell it. He didn't know a lot of that. John Kerry knows full well that we're not going to be going into this country and fighting for the moderates. We would be fighting Al Qaeda's fight. We'll be fighting the Muslim Brotherhood's fight. And, and to make it even worse, during that same hearing in the Senate, John Kerry said, look, uh, I know everybody's worried about the cost, but it's okay. These Arab oil sheiks have already offered to pay for our strike against Syria. Now, now think about that. The, Arab, the Saudi Arabians are willing to pay for us like we're mercenary soldiers. We're going to send our people in. We're going to use our arms because we have become this, this uh, really all we've, we're left is a, a military might. You know, we don't have manufacturing jobs. Our economy is on the skids. So the only thing we can actually say is, yeah, we're strong military might. So the, the Saudis say, well, OK, you know, you've got Prince Bandar coming over. You've got King Abdul coming over saying we really want to wipe out. We really want to do away with Assad. And so we're going to pay you to do that like we're some kind of cheap, uh, cheap mercenaries. Don't you get that impression? Right. We, we've become, you know, the Middle East hitman. You know, they, they need something done. They need some dirty work. They come over, they, they convince the U.S. It's the same thing that happened in Iraq. And so we're going to go into Syria and topple this regime for the benefit of Saudi Arabia. They want Syria so badly that they're actually calling on Vladimir Putin and saying, look, OK, if you, if you promise to stay out of this, you know, don't oppose any American strike, then we're going to buy $15 billion worth of weapons from your country, and we're going to give you first crack at our oil supplies. It's we're going to keep the prices low. For, uh, Farron, it's almost as if we've forgotten that, you know, 9-11, most of the people involved with 9-11 and, and murdering 3,000 Americans were, were from Saudi. I mean, they were Saudi. 
And right. so we, we, we forgave them for that. We helped them work their way through it, actually helped them get out of the country and all types of things that we did for Saudi Arabia. But now they, they, they're so comfortable with this relationship that they have with us that they're asking us to become the hitman for them. Now, look, this is obviously is about the military industrial complex at its worst, isn't it? I mean, we, we listen to Obama make these very moving speeches about the humanitarian aspects about this. This isn't about the humanitarian aspects of, of Syria. If it was, we simply would start with diplomacy, wouldn't we? Right. War is great business. And, you know, some of the major contractors out there, Raytheon, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, you know, they've already had stock increases just in the last couple of weeks of between 20 and 37 percent, you know, each. So they're already gearing up. You know, if you happen to live near a military base, I'm sure you hear bombing. I, I, I do. I, I've seen the, the bombing practice taking place at night. I mean, the military it's, industrial it's complex is gearing up. Farron, one thing, I think you wrote an article not long ago talking about the fact that the the military uh, complex, the, the, the arms industry was making between 70 and 80 billion dollars a year and now they're making a, a, a meager 26 billion. So obviously a war would be good for them, wouldn't it? Right. I mean, they, they've had a couple tough years since, you know, we've drawn down Iraq a little bit. We've drawn down Afghanistan, but now they're ready to go back to the good old days they had during Bush when they were making 70 or 80 billion dollars a year. And a strike on Syria is exactly what they need to, to boost their profits. And what's going to happen is they're going to turn around, they're going to take those profits and they're going to pump it into the, you know, upcoming 2014 midterm elections. And politicians know that. I know a lot of them may seem like they're on the fence right now, but they know that if a Democratic president, if a Democratic Senate approves this strike, that contractor money is going to come back to them when they're up for re-election. They know that. That happens every single time. That's what gave Bush the office again in 2004 with Halliburton and KBR pumping all that Iraq war contract money back into Bush and Cheney. Farron, one thing that I see that is a, a little different about this run up to war, um, you started off by telling us that the stories uh, have changed three times about why it is that we should be doing this. And I, I interrupted you there. I don't want to get back to that. But one reason that the stories aren't selling quite as well is because it's not just corporate media selling the stories. We, you remember the run up to Iraq, you had people like Wolf Blitzer sitting in their off, you know, in their in their in front of a camera with holograms and maps. And it was like this grand uh, adventure that America was on. And you had all of the corporate uh, the corporate types just just hoping, praying to their advertising gods that we would have a good, glorious war. Now you have pushback, don't you? You do. And, and back then in 2002, the one person you had out there in the corporate media talking about the fact that this is a war based on lies, Phil Donahue, was promptly fired. You know, they, they couldn't have that back then. And there was no citizens media to fill that void. But, you know, this this whole Iraq mess is actually what gave birth to a lot of this citizens media. I know for one thing, it, it certainly gave birth to a lot of liberal talkers. You know, people just got tired of hearing the same right wing, you know, corporate talking points to help sell this war. So what happened as a result? You know, we ended up with 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 people like Ed Schultz, with Tom Hartman, you and Bobby Kennedy. And then we had all these blogs and websites. And, you know, back at the start of Iraq, we didn't have YouTube. We have that now. We can go back and watch a video of what Obama said in 2008 about the use of chemical weapons or, or whether or not the U.S. should be the world's police and compare that with what he's saying, you know, today and tomorrow. Well, we had we had some some YouTube and we had some we had some foundation, but it had not developed like it's developed now. And that is that really is a huge difference, isn't it? Uh, in the in the idea that you you know people people uh, I, I think they're weary of being lied to, uh, Farron. They they lived through the Iraq where they were lied to about weapons of mass destruction. They were told if we don't do this now then we're going to have uh, chemical weapons used on us here in the United States. Kind of what Kerry is saying right now. I mean, if you really listen to what Kerry's saying, one of his latest talking points was we have to go in there and we have to get control of the chemical weapons because if we don't, the bad guys are going to get them. Well, I think the bad guys already have them. But the point, that was, but, but the, the public now is willing to say, you know, I'm not buying into this. 
So they're doing their own digging. They're looking at places like Free Speech TV, Ring of Fire, going to the Ed Schultz show, going to Tom Hartman, going to, you know, all these people that are, that, that have worked so hard to try to, to, to tell the truth about what's really happening. And I think you're right. That wasn't, that structure wasn't in place the first go around, was it? No. Uh, it l l what, what about, what about this idea that we, this is humanitarian. That was one of the stories. Remember, we're doing right. this because this is humanitarian. What is your response to that? Well, right now, what's happening in the country is that you have a group of bad guys fighting against one bad guy. I mean, neither one of those are a side that we want to be on. You know, we don't want to embolden the, the Muslim Brotherhood. We don't want to embolden Al Qaeda. And we, we certainly don't want to embolden uh, Assad. But if we go in there and we make a strike against Assad, it's going to help out the Muslim Brotherhood and Al Qaeda. If well, we first go of all, there's a vacuum where there's really a huge vacuum there, isn't it? In other words, if you're talking about some some of the countries where you had uh, the the you had uprisings in, in, in some of the Arab regions. There at least was in place an infrastructure to build out a fair democracy. Now, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a perfect democracy, but at least there was some infrastructure to build out that democracy. That does not exist in any form or fashion here. Even if we topple Assad, we have basically al-Qaeda involved anyway. And for, for Kerry to say we can stop that is just a ridiculous argument because there, there's a huge vacuum that, uh, that exists if Assad is, is toppled, isn't it? Exactly. The Assad family has been running Syria for over 30 years. You know, th th this is all the country knows. They don't know democracy. I, I know they, they say that <laughs> the current Assad was elected, but all it was was a reaffirmation of him as president. You know, it was not a legitimate election. This was just his way of saying, look, I'm, I'm elected, I'm not a dictator. But still- Any way the, the possible, let me, let me ask you this. Um, the, it would be absolute suicide for the Democrats to say, uh, you know, we're going to we're going to push and push and push regardless of what public opinion is. Don't you think that is somewhat political suicide? I, I do. And because right now in this country, there is not a single demographic, no, no, no race, no political party, no religion, no age group that wholly supports this war. Right now, everybody is opposed. And, you know, the closest gap right now is among registered Democrats. So I think there's about a 12 point gap between those who oppose and those who support. But I, I think a lot of the problem is coming from within the Democratic Party itself, because you do have those Obama bots out there who say, you know what, I, I don't think we should strike Syria, but if Obama says we should do it, then we should support Kinda him. Kind of like the same, same numbskulls who said that about George Bush. It was the same thing. It's my party. And I'm not, I can, I can set aside my rational thought because it's my party. Exactly. Aaron Cousins, thank you for joining me. Uh, you know, this is a story that uh, either way, uh, we're going to be following this story for a long time because the ramifications are going to be long term. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can keep up with us throughout the week online at ringoffireradio.com, on Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio, and on Facebook. I'm Mike Papantonio, and we'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.